this video is going to go over all the AP Calculus, AB exam things to watch out for. Ideas, tricks, things to be careful of, of, and so forth. So let's go through a whole bunch of things that I think are useful to remember. First of all, the limit process for finding derivatives is this. So if you see something like that or want to have to know where the derivative comes from, it's this process. Some textbooks write it differently, but the derivative comes from the limit as change of x approaches zero of slope. This is slope of a function. Understanding continuity and differentiability of a piecewise. Here's a piecewise function. It's two functions that are pieced wisely together. At And then for this function, it's from the negative side to 3, including 3. And for this function, you're going from the positive side, greater than 3, not including 3. So basically, you have two graphs pieced together. And what you want to do with this a lot of times is you want to talk about continuity and differentiability of this function. And so you want to check, basically, if these two values connect, or if each individually is continuous. We're talking about continuity. So you want to talk about, like, do they connect at 3, as well as are each one individually continuous? And for differentiability, you want to look at the slopes of these two equations, the derivatives, and make sure the derivatives exist throughout of both of them, or if the derivatives are the same at 3. So, Anyways, just make sure you're careful with piecewise and continuity and differentiability for these situations. It's a, there's quite a few questions like that, most likely, on the test. Um, a couple of questions on the test you might run into is y prime equals x y. You'll see that. What that means is the rate of change of y is proportional to y. This is the rate of change of y is proportional to y. And when you see that statement, or this, you should imply this right here. This is the formula it will turn into. When you integrate this and make it y equals, it gets to this function. And it's called a separation of variables to get here. Uh, this is a continuously compounding event. And uh, k is kind of like your rate. This is time. And, and this is the, the, the what you are increasing or decreasing. Um, and this is the output. Anyway, so just if you see this or this phrase, realize this is what we're looking for. It's a good little trick for shortening things up. Okay, next. Um, before you differentiate or integrate, rewrite the following type of functions. Basically, a lot of people mess up on the test because they don't rewrite things before they integrate or differentiate. Um, for instance, this, they forget to write it like this and see, oh, that's a chain rule when you're driving. Okay. So it's helpful to rewrite it and think about it. This one, people do dumb mistakes and they go, oh yeah, I forgot this is a negative power. And that's real easy to integrate or derive. People see this and they start doing all sorts of crazy stuff and they forget, oh wait, I could divide both of these by x to the third. And when you divide both of these, you get 1, and this would be to the negative first power, and I could derive or integrate those pretty simply. And for this one, you want to rewrite this as a fractional power, and this would be for derivative chain rule or integration, where you really do, can't really do it with integration right now. But um, anyways, just make sure you rewrite things before you try to derive and integrate them. Um, don't forget that's so common in AP tests. They make, they make easy problems with little tricks like this that people don't do or mess up with. Number five here, um, make sure you know your Riemann sums. Left, right, midpoint, trapezoid. They're all called numeric approximations. Just make sure you know those. Very good. They will guarantee have several of those. And each interval can have the same or different meaning sometimes all the intervals are the same. Sometimes maybe the first interval is 2, the next interval is 5, the next interval is 8. So just pay attention to the intervals of these. And then also know on these kind of problems, on the left and right, it's make sure you can tell if it's a over approximation or under approximation. Basically, are the rectangles under the graph or above the graph? Midpoint and trapezoid tend to be very close to the answer. But all these are very feasible um, possibilities on the test. So be very careful. OK. Next couple. You want to know how to sketch f and f double prime if you're given the derivative function. Meaning you're given a graph or tables of f prime. Now it could just be the graph of it, tables of it, or even the function. But in general, usually it's the graph or the table of it. And you want to be able to go down to this integral, which is f, or derive it to f prime. Now to do that, to make those graphs or to look at the tables, you need to focus on the extremas. 
between the, abs the, the relative maxes and mins and the points of inflections. Because that's where the second derivative is zero, this is where the first derivative is zero. And so if you look at those of this graph, it really helps going up and down. So pay very close attention to these things. But make sure you can go both directions. Because most of the time on problems, they tend to give you the derivative and make you work both directions. They don't tend to start with f and go up twice. But they, they can. But in general, they start with the middle and choose to go both directions. Very, very common. All right. Um, understanding the relationships between motion, velocity, and acceleration. First thing is, you have to realize that basically acceleration is the derivative of velocity and the second derivative of position. So basically, a velocity, you can also think of position. Velocity is the derivative of position. But basically, you know that connection between the three of these. Very huge. Tons of position problems um, on, on the test, on motion, called motion. Um, a very important thing, they always have the speed, the word speed. Speed is the absolute value of velocity because you don't care about direction. Remember, velocity has a negative or a positive, which clarifies direction of your velocity. Um, if you have total distance, we hear the word total distance, you should be thinking about um, the absolute value of the function on the interval. Because, um, actually, let's start over. If I want position, what you do for position, you start with the initial position, where we start, and we add up the change. Because, by the way, most of the time you're starting with velocity. That's almost all the time they give you velocity. And if I'm trying to get to position from there, you have to integrate velocity. And that will give you the sum of change. But you have to start where you, where did you begin? And so they give you initial position, and then you add all the change that's happened over that time. And this right here would give you your position of the function. This right here is total distance, because total distance doesn't care about your initial position. All it cares about is the change. But any negative change, it can't use negative change, because negative change will mess up your answer in, um, when you talk about total distance. Because if we go in the negative direction, we're still moving. So when you absolute value it, what it does, when you take the absolute value, what an absolute value does is it takes, say your graph looked like this. If your graph goes like this, okay, what your absolute value does, this is your velocity, it takes your graph and flips, sorry, it's not perfect, but this graph right here is now flipped over, so it adds this area, this area, and this area, it makes them all positive. And that would be your total distance traveled. Because this down here, when you integrate velocity, is negative, but that's still distance. So we need to add this green plus this plus this for position, because that's movement back, forth, back, forth. But when we're trying to hold the distance, we need what was under to be flipped and become positive. So again, there's an absolute value here for total distance. Position, starting point, and add up the change. And I know this kind of looks like speed. This is kind of speed. It's the, it's the integral of speed. But we're not going to talk about that one too much. Um, anyways, the second fundamental theorem of calculus um, is the derivative of an integral in this form. Remember, it's the derivative of the integral. On the AP test, they'll sometimes just not give you this and just give you this right here. It's kind of mean. And people think it's a second fundamental theorem of calculus, and then it's not. And it's a shortcut. It's a very simple thing. And it's all about spotting it and seeing the shortcut. All we do for second fundamental theorem of calculus is you take this, you plug it into T, see right here, and then derive that and multiply by it. It's very simple. If you don't notice that shortcut simply, you're going to have to integrate it, plug in these two values, and then derive it again. It takes forever. Never do the long way. Simply understand the second fundamental theorem of calculus and attack. Just don't forget to multiply by the derivative at the end. Very commonly missed. Or what happens is people plug this in, and they forget to make that x to the sixth, and this is 2x to the third, but they forget to plug that in and, and do the powers properly. OK, number nine. Very common and basic thing. If you have this integral, you can flip-flop it and make it negative. So see how the integral is backwards? It's supposed to be a to b. So what you do is you just oh, put a negative in front and flip the interval. It's kind of cool. Uh, number 10 here, if I want to find, uh, be careful not to integrate when you're supposed to derive and vice versa. It's, it's very common and very easy to integrate and derive backwards. <laughs> I hate when I do that. And I think you're guilty of that. It's sometimes um, derive when you're supposed to integrate, integrate when you're supposed to derive. Just double check. Make sure you don't make, don't make dumb little mistakes. It just stinks. I hate making those dumb mistakes. All right, um, remember that if I have an integral, I can separate it into two separate integrals. Because if I did this all by itself, this is a u substitution here, but it kind of causes problems. But if I separate it into two separate ones, I could do u substitution for this one, 
and then I can do this one without use substitution. So it's sometimes important to be able to separate your integral. Um, remember with washer method, um, when you do washer method, don't forget the pi, very common to forget pi, first of all. But remember that it's the outer radius squared minus the inner radius squared, depending on where you're revolving it from, depending on what you're revolving, again, from. Um, sometimes you're revolving from the side, remember this? If uh, this is my this is my axis, sometimes I could be revolving s at around this. Sometimes I could be revolving around this. Okay, let's say this is the function. That's the picture. Sometimes I revolve it around around this. Sometimes I'm revolving this around this axis. Um, depends, and so it's always the outer minus the inner. But the, the whole point of what I'm trying to get at here is that you square each individually. You don't just subtract and then square. People do that all the time. Make sure you square each individually and also don't forget the pi. Um, when you find the definite integral of a derivative, um, of a derivative, sorry, when you find the definite integral of a derivative, which is the rate function, use, you are finding the total change, the sum of change from A to B. Here's what I mean by that. This is a definite integral of the derivative. When you integrate a derivative, you get f. And then you plug in b and a. So right here, can you see this is a total change? It's the farthest, the biggest, sorry, the end value minus the beginning value. And it's the difference. It's, it's uh, minus the change that's happened over time. From b to a, this is the change, the difference. So again, when you are integrating a derivative, you're finding the total change that's happened over that time. So it's, it's a pretty simple concept here. It's a really important concept. All right, next, uh, whenever you're asked where a function is decreasing, you're finding where the slope of the function is negative. So if I'm going to find out where a function is decreasing, I'm finding where the slope is negative. All right, the slope is negative. It, it happens all the time. People see the word decreasing and forget it. It means derivative, negative. Slope, negative. Or say you say the function is increasing. That means slope positive. So you, you first find out what's the function. So what's the function? And from that function, you think, OK, to increase means derivative, and it means derivative positive. So just be careful about increasing, decreasing. And be careful using it in a recent justification, because it implies deriving, and it implies the derivative is positive or negative. So it's very important. This word, of decreasing and increasing, um, are very important words and be very careful with how you use them and interpret them. Used a ton on the test. Um, next, uh, be careful on chain problems with multiple steps. A lot of times people mess up on chains, and here's an example of it. Um, the most common one is, say, this. Um, if this is it, this is like a, I call it a double chain. You have multiple step chains going on. So um, you want to be careful, especially with these double chains. Just don't miss little pieces. A lot of times, even with simple chains, people forget to do the chain rule, the uh, the last derivative part. So just be be careful about that kind of thing. It, it's pretty important. 